Hi, I'm Dr. David Adley. This video is intended for my physics students in physics in Physics 112 at the Community College of Aurora, but it should be useful for all introductory science students who are beginning with their career in the lab sciences. In this video, I'll be doing a brief introduction to error analysis. So the different types of error that can occur when we're doing measurements in lab, how we can deal with those. I'll do a brief, very, very brief introduction to error propagation, and then I'll finish talking a little bit about hypothesis testing. Let's get started. First, let's talk about the different types of error that can occur when we're doing a measurement. Um, so we can have random measurement error. Um, this is what happens if, say, our eye isn't quite perfect, if there are limitations in the precision of our instrument. Um, so we get our instrument that's rounding to either, you know, 1.1 millimeters or 1.2 millimeters, um, but really the, the length is like 1.1473 millimeters, um, so we lose some of that true underlying information um, due to the precision of our instrument. Um, some of this could be caused by limitations in us, by limitations in our ability to make timing measurements or the precision of our eye. All of those are sources of random measurement error. We can also have systematic error. Um, systematic errors are different from random measurement errors because they can introduce bias. If there's a factor in our experiment um, that we're not thinking of, like the presence of friction in an object that's sliding along the ground um, that we're not taking into account, that can shift the average value of our measurements away from what you would expect theoretically in the absence of, or in the true absence of friction. Um, so if, uh, to continue the example, if we had a perfectly frictionless surface like we always like to assume in physics and we have a puck sliding along it, then all of those equations that assume no friction would work just fine, but in the real world, because there is friction, if we neglect that, then the theoretical prediction we would make, assuming no friction, is going to be different from what we from what we measure in our experiment in a systematic way. So we're going to see a shift in the average of our experiment compared to what we'd expect theoretically. And that's different from random measurement errors because random errors, they might be positive or they might be negative, but if you take 10,000 measurements and average them all up, they should all center around zero. Um, there's actually a theorem in mathematics that says specifically that that's true. It's called the central limit theorem. And then finally, the last type of um, error that we need to think about is what happens if we take measurements that we make in our lab and then we use those to do calculations. If there are intrinsic uncertainties in the measurements that go into the calculation, the result of that calculation also is going to carry some uncertainty. And in order to figure out the uncertainty from the result of the calculation, we have to do what's called error propagation. Um, we're not going to do much of that in my class, um, but it does become important as you continue on, um, especially if you become professional lab scientists. Um, so I'll say a little bit about that um, as we go along. So I've already said a little bit about types of random measurement error on the previous slide. Um, there's some more examples here. So if you have an imprecise positioning, if say we're trying to measure the length of that thumbtack and it turns out the thumbtack is not actually positioned at zero on the ruler. So if we don't notice that and take that into account, that might lead to a measurement error. Um, now in this case, that's gonna mean that we have well, let me say that a different way. If those positioning errors are indeed random, so maybe we have the thumbtack shifted a little bit positive here, but then the next time maybe I pull it out and put it back and try and measure it again, 
and next time I shift a little bit negative, um, so we go from a positive bias to a negative bias, that's an example of a random measurement error. On the other hand, if I don't notice that I have that shift and I just say, okay, I'm going to take three different measurements along that ruler, I'm going to like look at it, record a measurement, look away and come back. That's an example of systematic error, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So that's, that's really what we would call a calibration error. All of the limitations inherent in us, in our ability to click a stopwatch, the limitations of our eye, as well as fundamental limitations in our instruments, and also in the quality of signals can be important. Um, so as we're working with electricity and magnetism this semester, um, for example, we might be using digital multimeters to measure the current coming out of a circuit. Um, very low currents can be hard for our multimeters to measure uh, because the current itself produces the signal that goes into the multimeter and then produces the measurement. Um, so if you have a very low current, that might result in a larger error in the multimeter um, due to the limitations in the input signal. Um, this is particularly important in my field in astronomy when oftentimes we can be limited by the amount of light coming to us from a source. Um, so we have intrinsic uncertainty in our measurements due to the limited brightness and therefore the limited quality of our data. Um, this is much less common in uh, lab sciences like biology or chemistry because we can always just increase the volume of our experiment to make sure that we're getting a good signal. Once we have those measurement uncertainties, um, so for example, I'll pop back to the previous slide, uh, maybe I know that I'm being super duper careful so I'm limited by the tick size on my ruler. So I can give a measurement of length that's good to about half of a tick, so about half of a millimeter in this case. Uh, but beyond that, I can't be any more precise just due to the actual limitations in the measurement device itself. So I take that measurement error, half a millimeter, and then I want to use that length that I, that I measure to do some calculation. So I don't know, I want to calculate the volume of a pen or whatever. When I do that calculation, that measurement error, that half a millimeter uncertainty in length, will contribute some uncertainty to the volume of the pen when I go and I do my calculation. So if I want to take that volume that I calculate and report it to another scientist who might do something useful, or if I want to compare it to a hypothesis to do hypothesis testing, I need to know how certain I am of that calculated volume. Now, of course, in this case, I wouldn't do that. The volume of a pen is trivial, uh, but it's just an example. So if I want to calculate the uncertainty on the volume of the pen, Knowing that the input measurements are themselves uncertain, I have to do error propagation. Um, there's a couple examples of how error propagation works um, on, the, on the slide here. Um, so I've showed what happens if you are adding measurements or subtracting, adding or subtracting, um, in which case the uncertainty on the result of that addition scales um, quadratically with the uncertainties on the input measurements. Um, so that's, this should look really familiar to you, the sigma z squared equals sigma x squared plus sigma y squared. That looks a lot like the Pythagorean theorem. Um, it's not an accident. Um, so if you wanted to know the uncertainty on the output z variable, then you would take the square root of the uncertainties on the input variables x and y. Alternatively, maybe if you're multiplying or dividing, um, you end up with a slightly more complex formulation, which you can see towards the bottom of the slide there. And basically what that's saying is that the fractional uncertainty on the output, z, scales with the fractional uncertainties on the input measurements, 
x and y in that um, same quadratic fashion. So when we make measurements and we use those measurements to draw conclusions, the limited precision on the measurements themselves also limit the precision of our conclusions. Up to now, I've been talking about random errors, errors that might be biased high or might be biased low. So if you collect lots and lots of them, we're going to start to push those errors down. But there's this other form of error which can crop up, which is called systematic error, sometimes called systemic error. Um, that's less common. But these represent, as I said earlier, biases away from a true underlying value caused by factors that we might not be aware of or that can be very difficult to identify. Um, some of these are calibration errors, so if you catch it, you can go and fix it in your lab equipment, but others can be due to factors that are really, really difficult to characterize. Um, so systematic error is oftentimes the bane of experimentalists because if there are unknown systematic errors in your results, that's going to make it more challenging to draw conclusions based on your data. So if we want to do error analysis which are with our labs, which you'll be getting plenty of practice in this semester, um, we want what that means is that we want to know the overall precision or reliability of our experimental results. Oftentimes in class, what we'll be doing is we'll be comparing a measured value to a theoretical result. But in reality, if you're working in a lab for real, whether it's a research lab or if you're in a medical lab, you need to understand the inherent uncertainties in your lab equipment and then keep track of that and carry it forward so that you can think about the uncertainties in your conclusions. Um, to cite uh, an example of this in pop culture that's really relevant right now, um, there's the Netflix show Don't Look Up, um, and if you see the trailer for that, don't worry, I'm not going to give any spoilers. Um, in the trailer, one of the astronomers says that there's a 99.78% chance of an asteroid hitting the Earth. Um, that's an example where there are some inherent uncertainties in input measurements and you carry that forward to make a conclusion about the uncertainty in the output, in this case a probability of impact, and the uncertainty in that impact probability is really quite low. Um, it's about 0.2% or give or take a little bit. This process, this error analysis process, is really, really important if we want to use our lab data to draw conclusions, um, usually by comparing the result of our lab with the predictions from some hypothesis. I'll say more about hypothesis testing in just a minute, but before I do that, I want to present a challenge to you. I want you to use the image on the left-hand side of the slide to estimate the length of the drywall anchor. Um, so if you're not familiar with the drywall anchor, that's the like weird-looking beige thing on the left-hand side of the image. There's a ruler that's calibrated in um, centimeters, um, so each of the large ticks on the ruler is one centimeter. So use that to estimate the length of that drywall anchor figure out what you think the uncertainty on your measurement of that length is, and identify any sources of measurement error that could go into that result. Um, so if you see any systematic errors, um, correct for them if you can, or if not, if you can't, at least note what they are. Um, and I'm going to uh, have a discussion for the first week of class this term where I'm going to ask you to give the results for this. Um, so go ahead and pause the video here, answer these questions. Okay, so I'm going to assume that you paused the video and uh, made some notes and you have some answers brewing. So I'm going to move on now to finish by talking about hypothesis testing. 
And this is what we do if we try to determine if an experimental result agrees with the prediction of a particular hypothesis. Um, so we might have a scientific hypothesis that predicts that a measurement should have a certain value. And you can see that represented as that solid horizontal line across the bottom of the slide. And then in our experiment, we've gone out and we've tried to test that hypothesis. We've measured that value, whatever it is in the lab. Um, and we've gotten a result that has a value given by that circle. And then it has an uncertainty around that value that's given by the error bar. And so what we, what we want to know is whether that measurement given by the value in the error bar agrees with our prediction. So what do you think? Does the measurement match the prediction? I'll give you a second to think about that. If you need more time, pause the video. Hopefully you all said no. Now there are some subtleties that vary by discipline. Different disciplines require different degrees of um, discrepancy before you claim a discovery. Um, but here, the prediction is well, well outside of the range allowed by the data. Um, so unless you're working in a discipline that requires an extremely large discrepancy in order to claim a, a real difference, then chances are that you would say that this hypothesis does not match this prediction. Um, now, this is starting to get into some deeper issues of statistics and uncertainty. And as you continue in your careers as um, scientists, you'll learn more about how we use statistics to do hypothesis testing, the criteria required to either accept or reject a hypothesis. Um, but for now, we can look at this and say the prediction lies well outside of the range allowed by the data, and so they do not agree. Okay. Thanks for watching. Um, I will talk to you in a synchronous online session um, for the first week of class when we'll start talking about charges and other interesting material related directly to electricity and magnetism, the material for this semester. Um, so I hope that this has proven to be a helpful use of your time um, to watch this asynchronously, and I look forward to the rest of the semester. Bye for now.